Welcome everyone to a VOCA funding update by the Office of Crime Victim Services, also known as OCVS. OCVS strives to keep our subgrantees informed and to be transparent with future funding outlooks and projections. Thank you so much for joining us. Presenting today from the Office of Crime Victim Services is myself, Teresa Nino, the Director of Grant Programs and Training. And then also joining me is Amanda Powers, and she is our VAWA and VOCA Program and Policy Analyst. During this presentation, we will share with you an update on the VOCA fix, so what the VOCA fix did and did not fix, an overview of VOCA federal awards specific to Wisconsin, and the future outlook of VOCA funding. I will now pass over to my colleague, Amanda Powers, to discuss the VOCA fix. Thank you, Teresa. This information is not new for us, but I wanted to make sure that it was in one centralized location. So I have shared the VOCA fix legislation on the screen. I've also included a link to it so folks can see the legislation language in its entirety. As a reminder for folks, the VOCA fix was passed into law on July 22nd of 2021. What did the VOCA fix change? A brief overview of the most important aspects that relate to the uh, VOCA victim assistance is that it added a new source of revenue to the Crime Victims Fund, or the CVF. That new source of revenue was deferred prosecutions and non-prosecution agreements um, agreed to by the U.S. Attorney's Office. So those penalties and fees associated with deferred prosecution and non-prosecution agreements will now be diverted to the Crime Victims Fund rather than going into the general treasury. Uh, also impacting VOCA victim assistance was an increase to the state compensation formula. The reason this impacts VOCA victim assistance is that first, the formula for uh, state compensation awards is factored into the uh, balance for the Crime Victims Fund for when awards are being made. And then based on the remaining amount after compensation, the awards to states are made for state uh, victim assistance funds. So that's why that piece was included here. If you need more information, you can reference the VOCA fix legislation. And finally, the last piece that was immediately uh, important to our subgrantees was the National Emergency Mandatory Match Waiver requirements. Also helpful for folks to understand, as a reminder, the Crime Victims Fund, that's where all of the VOCA awards come from. It's fines and forfeitures assessed against federal criminals in addition to those deferred prosecution and non-prosecution agreements. Um, this is also important to understand as the U.S. Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime, where we receive our award from, has also included uh, memos to U.S. attorneys' offices so that they understand the impact of the Crime Victims Fund. So U.S. attorneys are able to see um, what VOCA funds support in their state for victim services and understand the impact that having fines, forfeitures, deferred prosecution, and non-prosecution agreements, what those fees and penalties provide for the states that they work in. And this is important to understand. And if if there are any questions about VOCA fix, please reach out to our office and we can provide additional assistance if needed. So when we talk about what the VOCA fix did and did not fix, what we mean is the VOCA fix had immediate impact on certain aspects of the Crime Victims Fund and there's delayed impact to other pieces of the VOCA fix. What we mean by delayed is not that it, there's a implementation period to the legislation. It just means that it's going to take a while for states and for subgrant agencies to see the impact of the VOCA fix after the legislation was acted. So I've divided those pieces into two categories. As I mentioned, we see the immediate impact of the VOCA fix. That was the mandatory match waivers that was implemented during the national emergency. So in our case, it was the pandemic. This was instrumental in mandating that states 
across the nation, including territories, had to issue mandatory match waivers. So some states did not have match waiver processes. They had to implement them and ensure that their subgrantees could get match waived during the pandemic. We've already had a process in place. This simplified matters and that we were able to cut out the request process for subgrantees that needed match waivers, which really helped to reduce and eliminate, in a lot of cases, the administrative burden on our subgrantees relating to match waivers, and then greatly reduce the administrative burden on OCDS's part that we were able to issue those mandatory match waivers. The other immediate impact is, as I mentioned, there was additional sources of revenue that were identified for being routed to the CBF. When the legislation was enacted, immediately those additional sources of revenue now diverted to the CBF. So they weren't going to the general treasury anymore. Once that legislation was passed, we were seeing those sources of revenue being deposited into the CBF. On the flip side of that, we're not sure of when we're going to see increased balances to the CBF fund. So what do I mean by that? We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, but the reason that we've had increased awards in the past is that the CBF balance was, I believe at its highest point, it was $12 billion. It's not at that level anymore. And when we have additional sources of revenue for the CBF, we're hoping to see that balance build back up. We don't know if it'll ever build back up to its previous level, and we don't know the time frame that will take. I think it's important to remember that for context, a lot of the um, biggest benefits to the CBF fund that we've seen when there were larger cases against um, corporations, when it was white collar crimes, we saw larger fines, forfeitures, penalties that were being assessed against federal criminals, and those were being deposited in the Crime Victims Fund. So we're hoping um, that, again, with the implementation of the VOCA fix, uh, we also had a change in administration at the federal level, so it took time for U.S. attorneys to be appointed. You know, we're seeing that transition, that that has an impact on the fines and forfeitures that are being assessed to go into the Crime Victims Fund. So we're seeing that delayed impact. So as I'm talking about the unknowns, we don't know the future CDF deposits. We don't know pending federal cases that could lead to potential CDF deposits. That again, leads to the um, uncertainty with the time frame, time frame for the VOCA fix impact. What is resulting that we do know right now is that we are seeing nationally across all states and territories that their VOCA victim assistance wards are lower over the last few years than what they were back in 2018. So that is consistent. And again, we're seeing that delayed impact and we don't know what that time frame will be for seeing the CBF fund build up again. So for specific context, on the screen, you can see the last eight years of federal VOCA victim assistance awards to the state of Wisconsin. At the top, you can see our award from 2014. That was prior to the cap being raised at the federal level. So for a reminder, Congress sets the cap about the amount of funds that can be withdrawn from the Crime Victims Fund for one given federal fiscal year. So in 2014, the cap was at $745 million. If you bump down to the next line for 2015, federal fiscal year 2015, we can see the cap was raised that first time to $2.361 billion. So that's a drastic increase. And you can see accordingly that our award at the state level increased drastically. Now, again, if you want to go through each year and review the state award amount that you see, a cap, you'll also see that a higher cap doesn't necessarily mean a higher state awards. That's important to note. But what I do also want to highlight is that at our highest amount, we had $58 million awarded to the state in federal fiscal year 18. By comparison, the lowest one in recent years was federal fiscal year 21, when our award was closer to 18 million. That's quite a difference in the span of three years. So again, we're having to weather that fluctuation at the state level. The other piece that I 
I failed to mention on the previous slide was um, the VOCA fix also allowed no cost extensions to be issued or requested rather, and then issued to states um, for their VOCA awards. And we did do that for 20, uh, for federal fiscal year 2018. We were able to request a no cost extension to continue to utilize those funds through September of this year. However, as you can tell from our award amounts, we our award amounts are decreasing. So we are using up those funds faster than we have in the past. And if you look at the far right side, you'll see that there are uh, bolded grant periods. So that represents those four bolded grant periods represent the, the federal fiscal year awards that we are currently utilizing to support our VOCA subgrantees. The project period that starts October 1 of 2022 through September 30th of 2023 will utilize federal fiscal year 19, 20, 21, and 22 to subgrant uh, to support VOCA subgrants. And for folks that may not recall, our annual obligation for the federal fiscal year to support our subgrantees is approximately $44.5 million to support our VOCA subgrantees. Also important to note, as I mentioned with those bolded grant periods, we are also currently utilizing our newest source of funding for VOCA. So what I mean is we are currently having to utilize our federal fiscal year 2022 award to support our current subgrantees for the project period starting October 1. That has not happened in the past and that's new for us because we've seen such a drastic decrease to our VOCA awards. So I want to contextualize that so folks understand the big picture of what this looks like at the federal level, but then also what it means when we see this at the state level. So the, the reason for those decreased caps, those reasons for the decreased awards is because the CBF balance is getting to be smaller, which means that we anticipate in OCBS continuing to receive VOCA awards in the lower $20 million to $18 million range. And again, that's optimistic for our federal award. Speaking of what we're seeing with the future of VOCA funding, I'm going to hand it back to Teresa to talk about what that means for subgrantees and what we see moving forward. Thank you so much, Amanda. We would now like to share an update on future VOCA funding. And this would be for all states and applicable territories, including Wisconsin. So as Amanda mentioned, with the lower cap and a lower CVF balance, this means that Wisconsin in turn will receive a lower VOCA award. And unfortunately, it also means that we will have less funding for subgrants. To further clarify, VOCA is a formula grant, so OCVS is not able to influence the award amount that we receive. The amount is determined by the federal formula set forth, and unfortunately, that means that we are unable to request additional VOCA funding for our state, although we know Wisconsin would benefit greatly from additional funding. As OCVS has been working on preliminary projections, optimistically, it is our belief that our future award levels will be similar to fiscal year 2021. This, of course, is subject to change, but if, as predicted, our next competitive in 2024 will be much different than what we saw in 2019. And as a reminder, in 2019, we were able to award out around $44.5 million. So I now want to continue talking about the future of VOCA funding and then some next steps for all of us. So due to that swift reduction in the federal VOCA award, OCBS is currently experiencing unprecedented budget considerations. For example, even with the ARPA dollars that came into our state to help supplement the VOCA reductions, we now must rely on turn back to fully award our 2022-2023 VOCA year. This is absolutely new territory for OCVS, as we've always been able to maintain a consistent flow of funding. 
So of course, the next question is, what does this mean? This means that we're going to have to be creative as we look at funding across the state. We are absolutely committed to partnering with all of you as we navigate these new challenges. And really with our partnership in mind, let's talk about some next steps. So I'd like to offer some suggestions for all of us as we move forward. If you have not already done so, please consider sustainability for your victim services agency. OCVS is open to continued discussion and really being creative as we think about the future of victim services in Wisconsin. And as we go along this process, we'll rely on experts in the field to really truly understand how victims and survivors best receive services. And then lastly, and maybe most importantly, we must continue having open conversations and ensuring that all key players and partners are involved. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. We are here to help, and we look forward to our continued partnership as we navigate funding cuts across the state. Please don't hesitate to reach out to the OCBS grants and training team with questions or concerns.